In 1962, a stranger showed up in Jonesboro, Tennessee, seeking treatment at the Veterans Administration facility in nearby Mountain Home. This man took a job at the weekly newspaper in the town, working as a linotype operator and part-time reporter. And it was several years after his death before anyone found out who he really was. Today we tell his story. Hello, podcast listeners. I'm Steve Gelly, along with Rod Mullins, and you're listening to Stories, A History of Appalachia. Steve, it sounds like we've got another mystery on our hands that we look to hopefully solve this time around, but it seems like you've whet the appetite for me once again of somebody, a stranger, showing up at the Veterans Administration facility and then all of this other stuff, it's wrapped up into one, being a part-time reporter. Gosh, let's just not wait. Let's just move on with this story. Well, I'm going to tell you this before we start. I think this okay. may be one of the more interesting stories that we've ever done. Hmm. I'm looking forward to this then. If it's one of the most interesting stories we've ever done, not saying that the other stuff that we have done has not been interesting, but still, <laughs> I hope this is very interesting because it already sounds like it's a very interesting story. Well, David Curtis Stevenson is buried in the Mountain Home National Cemetery located in Johnson City, Tennessee. And his burial there has stirred controversy over the years. But um, we're getting a little bit ahead of ourselves. Today, let's start not at the beginning, but at the end. Mr. Hmm. Stevenson was a veteran of World War I, although he never served on the front in France. He was a second lieutenant, Company 36, Infantry, U.S. Army. And as a vet, he was entitled to free health care any time he needed it. And for his medical issues in 1962, he chose one of the premier VA centers in Appalachia at Mountain Home, Tennessee. So he chose to move to East Tennessee for that reason. He needed work, though, so he went to the Jonesboro Herald and Tribune because he had experience in the newspaper business. Now, the paper hired him as a linotype operator, you know, the one who actually physically put the paper together, you know, the letters and numbers and all that, a demanding mm -hmm. task before the computer era. They also let him do some part-time newspaper reporting. He also supplemented his work by selling a type cleaning machine, which apparently is something that was used in the newspaper industry. Hmm. Well, Stevenson took a room at a boarding house run by a local widow 20 years his junior, Martha Murray Sutton. The two got to know each other, and eventually love bloomed with the two marrying in the year 1964. The couple lived a typical small-town Appalachia lifestyle, socializing with friends, attending church and Sunday school. The two were happy. On June 28, 1966, David Stevenson died after a short illness. His final wish was to be buried in the Mountain Home National Cemetery. Unfortunately, that honor usually goes to those vets who are living at the center when they die, which Stevenson was not. Undaunted, his wife contacted her congressman, then Congressman Jimmy Quillen, and explained her dilemma to him. Congressman Quillen, in turn, pulled a few strings, and soon David Curtis Stevenson was laid to rest at Mountain Home. Twelve years later, an Indiana newspaper came calling to Jonesboro with a fantastic and dark story about the mysterious David Stevenson. And Rod, as a famous radio commentator once said, here's the rest of the story. All right. Now, why would an Indiana newspaper bother to visit Jonesboro, Tennessee in 1978? Because David Curtis Stevenson, better known in the Hoosier State as D.C. Stevenson, was a very famous, or uh, rather infamous man, a relic of the racism, anti-Semitism, and nativism that ran rampant in America during the 1920s. For you see, Mr. Stevenson was at one time the Grand Dragon of the Indiana Ku Klux Klan and a rumored candidate for the Republican nomination for president in 1928. You've got to be kidding me, Steve. No, I kid you not. I told you this is going to be an interesting story. Wow, that came out of left field. I mean, just totally out of left field on that one. Well, Stevenson was born in Houston, Texas, August 21st, 1891. Shortly thereafter, his family moved north to Maysville, Oklahoma. He attended school but never finished, instead leaving school to work as a printer's apprentice, beginning a career in the newspaper business. He was also interested in politics, becoming involved in the local populist party. 
But World War I intervened, and being a good patriot, he enlisted in the U.S. Army and went through officer's training. He never served overseas and was discharged in 1919 at the end of the war. In 1920, he moved to Evansville, Indiana, where he got a job selling coal to retail customers. He joined the Democratic Party in Evansville and immediately ran for office, seeking the Democratic nomination for the district surrounding the city. He lost that nomination, but he did catch the attention of Joseph M. Huffington, a Ku Klux Klan agent, or Clagle, from Texas, who had come to Indiana to organize the Klan in that state. He recruited Stevenson and put him in the group's inner circle. Between Stevenson and Huffington's efforts, the Evansville Clavern soon became the most powerful in Indiana, with new members pouring in thanks to Stevenson. Pretty soon, the Evansville KKK counted nearly a quarter of the white men in Vandenberg County as members. Well, encouraged and ambitious as well, Stevenson set up a base in Indianapolis where he created the Klan state newspaper, The Fiery Cross. He brought in more recruiters, giving them a cut of the membership fees the Klan charged while keeping a share for himself. And by the summer of 1922 and continuing until July 1923, the number of members Stevenson managed to recruit to the Klan rod averaged 2,000 a week. 2,000? Mm-hmm. Wow. That's a lot of people, you know, especially in that given time of that you know, span of a year. 2,000 a week? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, this success story soon attracted the attention of the National KKK. The head recruiter for that organization, Hiram Wesley Evans, developed a close relationship with Mr. Stevenson, because of Stevenson building the largest KKK state chapter in the country. Stevenson backed Evans for the office of Imperial Wizard of the Ku Klux Klan in November 1922, which he won, and in return, Evans named Stevenson the Grand Dragon of the Indiana Klan at the 1923 Klan Fourth of July gathering in Kokomo, with more than 100,000 members and their families in attendance. And at that gathering, Stevenson told the crowd... My worthy subjects, citizens of the Invisible Empire, clansmen all, greetings. It grieves me to be late. The President of the United States kept me unduly long, counseling on matters of state. Only my plea that this is the time and the place of my coronation obtained for me surcease from his prayers for guidance. All of this made Stevenson a very wealthy and powerful man in the Hoosier State and beyond. Evans also made the new Grand Dragon the head of recruiting for seven states north of Mississippi. He wasn't disappointed. In the 1920s, Klan membership in those states grew dramatically, and in Indiana, membership soon grew to include one-third of all the white men in that state. All this power and praise soon went to D.C. Stevenson's head. In September of 1923, he severed ties with the National Klan and formed a rival, KKK, based in Indiana. He also left the Democratic Party and became a Republican, mainly because Indiana was a Republican state. He supported the Republican candidate for Indiana governor, Edward L. Jackson, who was rumored to be a KKK member. With Stevenson's support, Jackson was elected governor in 1924, so along with the power and money of the KKK, now came political power. As Stevenson himself said, quote, I am the law in Indiana, unquote. He controlled not only the governor, but also enough state legislators to influence laws of all kinds that were passed in the state. He had become so powerful that he even began entertaining the thought of running for the Republican nomination for President of the United States in 1928. As they say, Rod, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. And mm. D.C. Stevenson's fall was going to be pretty hard. In January 1925, Stevenson was divorced from his second wife, Violet Carroll. His first wife, who was pregnant with his only child, divorced him for abandonment in 1917, shortly before he joined the Army. Well, that month of January of 25, he met an Indiana State employee named Madge Oberholzer at the inauguration party for his hand-picked governor, Ed Jackson. Well, they began to see each other casually. All that, though, changed 
on March 15, 1925. That day, she was called to Stevenson's mansion by a secretary who said that Mr. Stevenson needed to see her before he left for Chicago on a recruiting trip. Well, she came over and was met by his bodyguards. Stevenson was drunk, and he soon forced her to join him in the drinking, then ordered her to go with him to Chicago. She was then shoved into a car and driven to the train station and dragged onto a train, then pushed into a lower berth in a private compartment with Stevenson. Instead of going to Chicago, they got off the train in Hammond, Indiana, and rented a motel room. Now, during the time on the train and in the motel room, she was brutally raped and repeatedly bitten by Stevenson. Uh, The next morning, Madge awoke, bleeding and sore from wounds to her breasts, shoulders, and tongue. Distraught, she thought about taking Stevenson's gun and killing herself. Instead, she waited until he woke up, then she asked him for money to buy some makeup and a hat to, you know, to make herself presentable. Instead, she went to the local drugstore and bought a box of mercury dichloride tablets, a poison. She took three of them and soon passed out. Stevenson realized what she had done, and he panicked. He ordered his bodyguard to get them back to Indianapolis. During the ride, he forced Madge to drink ginger ale and milk to vomit, which worked as she threw up all over the inside of the car. She also came to and cried and screamed to be thrown out of the car and left on the side of the road to die. She later recalled him saying, You must forget this. What is done has been done. I am the law and the power. Well, they cleaned her up as best they could and deposited her at her house. She died a month after her savage rape as a result of the injury she suffered, gangrene set into several of the bite wounds, and the pills she'd taken. Importantly, she lived long enough to tell what had been done to her. Well, Stevenson was arrested, charged with rape and second-degree murder of Madge Oberholzer. After a trial, he was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Now, Stevenson demanded, I say he demanded that Governor Jackson pardon him or commute his sentence. Well, Jackson refused, leading Stevenson to turn on his protege and the rest of the Republicans he owned in the state capitol. He released lists of public officials who were or had been Klan members. The Indianapolis Times then interviewed Stevenson in prison and did an investigation, which resulted in several indictments against government politicians for bribery, including the governor, who lost his office. And with that, Klan membership collapsed in Indiana, along with the power it had held in the early 1920s. D.C. Stevenson then began pleading for his release, first in 1941, which failed. He had much more success in March 1950 when he was granted parole. By September, he had stopped seeing his parole officer and a warrant was issued for his arrest on a violation of probation. He was found and arrested on December 15, 1950 in Minneapolis, Minnesota. For this little foray, D.C. Stevenson earned an additional 10 years on his life sentence and was sent back into the slammer. Now, apparently, having had enough of him in December of 1956, He was paroled on the condition he'd leave Indiana permanently. So? He moved to Seymour, Indiana. Okay. That's not (laughs) leaving Indiana, though. Of course not. (laughs) This is D.C. Stevenson. He'll do what he wants to. That's right. He's the law. (laughs) He also married wife number three, Martha Dickinson. Now, they had a rocky marriage that ended in a separation after Stevenson was charged and convicted of attempting to sexually assault a 16-year-old in Missouri. Now, the judge hearing the case found him guilty, charged him a $300 fine and 30 days in jail, but he suspended those, provided he'd get the hell out of Missouri and never come back. This time, Rod, he indeed left the state when ordered to do so. He also finally left Indiana, since Martha wouldn't take him back. And at this point in his life, he was suffering some health issues. So he decided, for whatever reason, to seek treatment at the VA Center in Mountain Home, Tennessee. And we've already told you what happened after that, with the exception of this. The first, Martha Stevenson, the one in Seymour, had no idea where D.C. had gone. So she never bothered to divorce him, at least not until he actually died. So legally, she never divorced him, making D.C. Stevenson, in the end, a bigamist on top of his many other accomplishments. Yeah, accomplishments, yeah. Listen, I told you this was going to be one heck of a story. You know, some little old fella 
shows up in Jonesboro. And from all accounts that I've read, he was not racist in the least. He was just an average, ordinary, older man who married a widow, and they lived a comfortable, happy life in her house. And and then he passed away. And she never, ever suspected that this is what was going on. When did all of this start coming about, though, that this started coming out about him? Of course, I know it happened after he died and everything, but still, you know, is, isn't there some kind of, you know, maybe a question or controversy still to this day? I mean, he is mm-hmm. buried at Mountain Home, isn't he? Well, that's a whole other story in itself. And, and this all came out with that newspaper report in 1978. Mm-hmm. There are people who want to get him out of Mountain Home. But ah. They don't want a Klan leader buried over there. Mm-hmm. But there's not been a lot that they can do about that at this point. And so it's sort of sitting on the back burner. But yeah, if you if you go over there to Mountain Home at the cemetery and you look long enough, you will find D.C. Stevenson's grave right there. Well, you know, another amazing thing about this story, too, this is all set up in a pre-Facebook society, too, because mm-hmm. Sure enough, I mean, you know, the way that little towns are, and I'm being serious about this, little towns really don't pay a whole lot of attention to who you are, but when they start getting to know you and finding out things about you and the news starts traveling, it starts getting around. He must have played a very good, uh, how can I say it, person card, so to speak, that nobody really suspected anything of him doing anything like this before in his past. and. Thank goodness there was no Facebook out there, I guess, for his sake, because it would have ruined him anyway, I'd say, in the in the in the long run. It probably would have. You know, by all accounts, he's out there taking both little African-American boys and uh, Caucasian boys out and doing stuff with them, buying them ice cream cones, playing baseball. Not a hint of any racism in this man. Wow. It, It was just like a total, complete change for him. You know, all this arrogance he had earlier, even Mm -hmm. just a few years before he came to Jonesboro, apparently dissolved. And um, he just lived his life in peace, I guess, for the last few years. And probably, to be honest with you, those four years with his last wife were probably the longest period of time that he was happy with another person. Yeah, probably had and probably was at peace with himself during that time. Yeah, probably so. Wow. And, folks, that's the story of how a very powerful man running an entire state and with designs on the White House ended up leading a quiet life in Jonesboro, Tennessee. Thanks for listening. You can subscribe to the Stories Podcast at Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, iHeartRadio, and more. And we also have a YouTube channel, Stories, A History of Appalachia. Be sure to like and subscribe to our podcast there. Until next week, folks. So long, everybody.